All righty, Hebrews chapter 11, pick it up in verse 32. If you remember in, in verse 32, he just rattles off a handful of names, doesn't really give us any specific circumstances that revolve around these names. He just says, you know, these guys or these people are uh, examples of faith as well as what he's telling us. And tonight we're down, we've already talked about the first couple. Tonight we're down to Samson. He says in Hebrews 11:32, and what shall I say more? For the time would fail me to tell of Samson. All right. Um, now we know the account of Samson. You'll find that in Judges 13 through 16. If you want to kind of turn there maybe and try to follow along a little bit. Um, I, will, I will read some verses out of there. But in dealing with Samson, um, you know, Samson was an interesting character because why would he mention Samson on a list here of people that have a moment or at least a time of faith when in reality most of Samson's life was spent in rebellion? I mean, the bulk of his life was spent in rebellion. He was a guy that God had appointed judge over Israel. Now keep in mind there was a time before they had kings that they were ruled by God-appointed judges and Samson was one of those judges. Um, I personally believe that those judges didn't necessarily rule over the entire nation of Israel, but probably the more regional, um, had an area that they probably uh, judged in rather than just one judge took over after the other. But nonetheless, it doesn't really matter. The whole point is he was a God-appointed judge and, and he came along in a time like, like most times where the Israelites um, were, uh, had done, according to the first verse there, had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And as a, um, as a punishment for that, God allowed the Philistines to kind of overrun them and rule them for 40 years. All right, he wouldn't let them overrun the Philistines. He let the Philistines kind of have their way. And, and so that was a real problem. Well, in the nation of Israel, there was a husband and a wife um, who had no children, which is another common scenario we find throughout the Old Testament. She was barren, and so God blessed them with a child. That child was Samson. Now, a part of that blessing was basically that they raised the child under what's called a Nazarite vow. Nazarite is not the same as Nazarene, so don't put the two together, all right? But a Nazarite vow. It is basically a promise that she is going to, or that they, the parents, are going to raise this child under a certain covenant we'll mention here in a second. But also under that covenant, she agrees that during her pregnancy that she will also abide by that covenant uh, until he is born. Once he is born, then he is to abide by that, co that covenant. Now, here is basically what the Nazarite vow states. It has three basic restrictions. Number one is no wine, all right? No wine whatsoever, not to let it come to him. Anywhere whatsoever, you can see that in chapter 13, verse three through four of, uh, of Judges. And number two, there was not to be a razor come to his head, so he wasn't to shave his head, all right? And uh, in addition to that, there was no touching any kind of a dead body because that dead body would defile him. By the way, the, the, the razor cutting is in chapter 13, verse five. And then the no touching a dead body is in 13, verse six. And the idea in that is he doesn't want him to be defiled by any dead flesh whatsoever. And all of this was presented to his father Manoah and his wife by what the Bible says, an angel of the Lord. Now, once again, as we found before, when we deal with an angel of the Lord, we also find this out, that in addition to it just being an angel of the Lord, uh, we find that he is identified as God himself. So this again is Jesus Christ, all right? Pre-incarnate, they call that, pre-incarnate Christ, or you can call it a Christophany. It just simply means Christ. Uh, appearance, his coming, his showing of himself before he actually comes to earth and becomes man, all right? But this goes back, and I gotta say this, just for the record, we talked more extensively about this earlier, but just as a reminder, all right, repetition, as Jock says, all right? Uh, don't forget that what takes place here is this, that Jesus Christ is what's called omnipresent. He's everywhere all at once. So don't get the idea that when Jesus Christ 
uh, when the word became flesh, that, that that was something that just happened and it has no bearing at any other moment in time. We are limited by time, so for us, it, is, it took place on a time frame. In our time frame, it took place at this moment. However, you got to remember, God is not restricted by time. All right, God creates all things. Time is something God created. He existed before time. And so he is present at all moments in time. So Jesus Christ, in that same form, in that new body, in, the, in who he is even today, he could appear and could show himself in that same fashion in the Old Testament before it had ever occurred as far as our time scale is makes uh tells us okay so that's the situation so this is jesus christ himself that comes to him or comes to her and to manoah and tells them these things all right so that's the situation now what happens is is all of this is presented to them they know what's going to take place samson grows up and ultimately he judges israel for 20 years but keep this in mind he doesn't really regard this nazarite vow as all that important to him. In fact, he's a pretty rebellious guy. Uh, he kind of lives his life for himself. He does whatever he pleases. Now, you know, they were under the reign of the Philistines, and so he had battles with the Philistines. And from time to time, he fought the Philistines, and he would overthrow whoever he fought. And uh, we know of some of his major battles with him. We know of some great things that took place. Um, and, and we get that. Samson, you know, he's known for his great strength. And uh, he would stand up against many of them and, and still be able to have the victory. We know the ones where he, he took charge of them with the jawbone of an ass and he beat them all up and killed them. And we know the stories. We know the accounts that took place. So Samson was a great mighty guy because God had given them this supernatural strength. But, but he, didn't, he didn't really respect that and didn't really respect what God had called him to do. So there were times where he would even have fellowship with the Philistines. There were times where he'd join together with them and he'd make, you know, he'd make light of different things and he'd throw a riddle at them to answer a riddle. And first one thing and another, married a Philistine girl and uh, first one thing and another happened that and so he winds up losing his wife. Um, later then he uh, has an affair with a Philistine harlot by the name of uh, Delilah, which we all know the Samson Delilah story. We'll share that here in a moment. Um, but um, we find that all the way through his life, he has been a rebellious kind of guy. And, and so, you know, this, when he mentions him in Hebrews 11, he is not mentioning Samson as an example of faith because of his whole life. There is but one incident that he uses him and I really believe with all my heart that this example of faith that Samson is to give us centers around one single event in Samson's life, and that's his final days. Now, in his final days, here's what takes place. He has this relationship with Delilah. He has already broken the, the Nazarite vow. Um, you know, he, he was a party animal, so the no wine thing was kind of, a, you know, gone by the wayside. He had killed a lion and went on his way. And when he came back, he found that in the carcass of the lion, bees had made a honeycomb in there and there was honey. And so he took, he, in this dead lion, he took the honeycomb out of the dead lion, took it home, fed it to his parents, didn't tell his parents um, because he didn't want them to know that he had broken that. Um, kind of kept his life secret from them. Um, hadn't come out of the closet yet, so to speak. He, he kind of kept all of those things secret and bottled up. And so he had already broken all of his Nazarite vow with the exception of one, and that's the cutting of his hair. Now, a lot of times people say, well, all of his strength was in his hair. That's not true, all right, just, for the, just for the record. All right, the cutting of the hair was more of a last straw thing. It was, it was just, his rebellion had gotten to the point where he had broken every aspect of this vow that had been made for him. This covenant that he had with God, this was the very last straw. And so he had allowed this to take place in his life and in so doing, God took his blessing from him and, and that blessing was that great strength so that he could overcome the Philistines in battle. And so this is where it happens. And so the Philistines basically 
capture him, make fun of him, make light of him. Every now and then they'd bring him out into the courts before the people and they'd, they'd make fun of him. They gouged his eyes out to where he was blind. Um, they had just turned him into nothing more than a, than a show. Sad commentary. You know, I, not trying to just add a whole bunch of stuff to this, but just to stop and think for a moment. He is an example of someone who proclaims Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and then just abandons that, and it just makes them look foolish. Makes them look like none of it's real, like none of it means anything. And it's a reflection, becomes a reflection on who God is. When we claim to people that we are a child of God, and we tell people that we love the Lord, and we tell people that we want to serve the Lord, and then we choose to do differently, and they see that in our life, just so you know, they're making fun of us behind our back because we become hypocrites. Samson was that. He was supposed to be this man of God, a judge of God's people, Israel, and God had given him this great and mighty blessing and he had abused it all. And so this is the picture. So here's what takes place at the very end of his life. While chained between these pillars in a Philistinian court, we find that he prayed to God to restore his strength so that he could pull down these pillars. Now. I want to explain to you this Palestinian court. It was like more of a coliseum. And where he was at, there was like these upper platforms that were held up by these great pillars. And in these platforms, there were literally thousands of people um, that would be in these, you know, that's in this stadium. And it's held up by that. It would be as if you would take, for example, one of our uh, ball fields, one of our coliseums or something, if you could just take the support away and the whole thing just crumbled down and everybody that's in the stands all died, that would be the equivalent of what you see in this picture. So the main supports, they bring him out, and they chain him between the main supports. Now he knows what he's going to do when he goes out. He knows his heart and he knows in his heart that he has failed God. And in these final moments, he tells the guy that takes him out to chain him to the pillars. He says, do me a favor. Let me just feel the pillar. So I, I, he says, I don't have much strength. I'm weak. I just want to feel the pillar so I can rest upon them. Get me close enough to the pillars that I can rest on. So he could feel them and know right where he was at. And so he gets out there. They chain him to these pillars. And, uh, and in so doing, here's what happens. Judges 16, verse 23. Then the lords of the Philistines gathered themselves together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon, their god. By the way, Dagon is um, like a big fish head god. Um, he's, he's a fish, fish god is what he is. Um, just to give you a picture of what he looks like, and I, I don't like doing this, but I'm just going to do it just because it's true. But if you ever see the little hat that the Pope wears, that little pointy thing with a little slit in the middle, it represents a fish head. All right. It's, it's representative of Dagon, the Philistinian god. He's a fish head god, so just mark that down. Take a look at it next time you see him, all right? Uh, but nonetheless, Dagon is like a fish head god. And uh, he says, and, and they do so to rejoice. For they said, our God hath delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand, saying, Dagon delivered Samson into their hand. Now, of course, this is a slam on the God of Israel, our God. All right. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, Our God hath delivered into our hands our enemy and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us. And it came to pass when their hearts were merry, it means when they were drunk, that they said, Call for Samson, that he may make us sport. Come and bring him out, let's make fun of him, and let's tease him, and let's, let's just abuse him. All right. And they set, between, set him between the pillars. And Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there. There were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord, uh, o Lord God. And it's cool. When you read your text, if you're following along with me, look at the letters that are used for God when they're referring to Dagon. And now look at the letters that are used to refer to our Lord God. All right? That's because what you see there is God's name. All right? This is not just any God. And he calls him by name. Remember me. 
He says, I pray thee and strengthen me, and I pray thee only this once, O God. And listen, this is, a, this is a prayer for him to say, God, this is time. I want them to be able to see in me, I want them to see your strength. Um, for this moment of faith, for this one moment where Samson illustrated the faith and knowing that God could give him his strength to be able to pull these pillars down, to be able to uh, do what God has called him to do, for this moment of strength, I believe, is why he is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, for this one moment, that I may be once again avenge of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was borne up. These are the, the, the structural pillars, ones holding up all the weight of the one with his right hand, the other with his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. So it killed everybody that was in the upstairs. And because the upstairs collapsed on the downstairs, which by the way was where the bulk of the people were. You know, he says, tells you clearly there's about 3,000 people upstairs. That was all the leaders of the land. That was the diplomats. That was the guys that were pretty special. But downstairs was the standing room. That was where all the people were that were just the commoners. And, and there was a whole lot more underneath than what there were on top. And so he pulls these pillars down. So it all came tumbling down on them. So it killed them, killed these others. And uh, he says, let me die with the Philistines. So he does this. And then he says, then his brethren and all the house of his father came down and took him and brought him and buried him between Zorah and Eshtol in the burying place of Manoah's father. He had judged Israel 20 years. So what he did in that final moment was actually, I mean, the only real thing in his entire life that he did that was a godly thing to do. He had actually served God in one final moment, trusted God to give him the strength to do what he did. Um, I, I tell you, Samson was certainly a man that was capable of sin. I think we see that, obviously. Yet, even in that, he had been called upon the service of the Lord. That is a puzzling thing sometimes when you stop to think about it. But you know what? That's the same thing as it is today. God takes men who are very capable of sin, every one of us, very capable of doing wrong things, of sinning against God, of even rebelling against him, and uses us to do great things. And it's an amazing thing at what God does. Samson is a great illustration of that. Uh, so as a result, he did what God had called him to do. And for this reason, the Philistines hated him and they feared him because they knew his God, not because of what Samson could do, but they knew what his God could do. And even though he had never really fully committed unto the Lord, as a result, what we find is he dies at a very young age and uh, directly, directly as a result of his sin, directly as a result of his sin. Um, I, I, I think it would surprise us if we really knew how much that happens today. You know, because, I mean, if God gives us a disease or strikes us dead or whatever the case may be, there's multiple reasons why that can happen. Obviously, we just live in a world where there's disease and death and all that. And so it could just be because we live in a world and we got it and that's that. Could be because we sinned. It could be for multiple reasons. God may want to choose, use us as an example of what he can do to, re, to bring us and store us back to health just so people can see how great a God he is. There's a lot of different reasons. But with Samson, we see a very clear reason for his death and his clear reason is because of his sin and then because of his repentance god give me this moment god i want you to get the glory out of my life even though i've been a mess let you have it and then let him do this pulls the the, the, the pillars down so be sure your sins are going to find you out as they did in Sam, uh, with samson but at the same time he brought glory to god in the end and so he brought victory and god gave him victory so samson's faith it was in his willingness at the end to allow God to take charge of his life and give him that victory. And he trusted God to do this in that final act. Um, it's when we just put our faith and trust in God and say, God, okay, this is yours. I'm at a loss. I'm blind. My strength is gone. Here I am between two pillars. They're making fun of me. They're teasing me, uh, making sport of me. God, let this final moment bring you glory, all right, and avenge them at the same time, all right? That's Samson, and that's why his name is mentioned here, all right? Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start the next one, but I can guarantee you we probably won't finish it. 
right? But the second one is Jephthah. Um, this is one that you, you know, some people probably have not even heard of or haven't even ever studied, but he was also a judge. Hebrews 11.32 says, what shall I say more for the time would fail me to tell of Jephthah, all right? Uh, in the Old Testament, that E is an H. Just when you go from the Old Testament to the New, keep in mind you're going from Hebrew to Greek and sometimes the lettering changes and the names look a little different, but that's all that's taking place. All right, but Jephthah was an interesting individual. His father had an affair with a harlot, all right? Having done so, he produced a son, Jephthah, all right? Now, here's the problem. The children of his father's wife, he had a wife, and uh, the children of his father's wife hated him because of it and made a big issue out of it and forced him to leave uh, their land. All right, he's out of Gilead, and they forced him to leave his land. By the way, the land of Gilead would be of the tribe of Manasseh. All right, the two tribes we're going to be dealing with and dealing with Jephthah is Manasseh and Ephraim, all right, who are the sons of Joseph. All right. But nonetheless, they, they threw him out. They said, you got to go. Judges 11, 2, Gilead's wife bare him sons. His wife's sons grew up. They thrust out Jephthah and said unto him, thou shalt not inherit in our father's house, for thou art the son of a strange woman. All right. So they threw him out. So Jephthah leaves. And actually, you don't really see anything bad about Jephthah. He just, he, he just does what he, he just does his thing, all right? They threw him out. Okay, I'll go over here and live. And, um, and, and, and according to the scripture, he's this incredible warrior. In verse 1 of chapter 11 of Judges, he says, Now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor, and he was a son of an harlot, and Gilead begat Jephthah. So what happens is, is basically... He is of that land, he is of that tribe, but they throw him out, and uh, he's okay, and he just goes over here to live. Now, here's a problem. Um, because, again, of Israelites' disobedience, God allows the Ammonites um, to, you remember who the Ammonites are, don't you? Anybody know who the Ammonites are? Lot. Lot's, part of Lot's clan, the Ammonites and the Moabites. All right, part of Lot's clan, all right? So the Ammonites became this threat to Israel, and then Israel needed a hero, all right? They needed somebody to stand up against the Ammonites, and they had nobody. I mean, the, the Ammonites were just, just beating them up one right after the other, and so, you know, what goes around comes around. They have to go and talk to Jephthah. Hey, listen, can you help us out? And Jephthah's kind of a funny guy, I'll be honest, when you look at some of the comments. In Judges 11, 5, and it was so that when the children of Ammon made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to fetch Jephthah out of the land of Tob. They went to fetch him. So they were out of Hazard, Kentucky. All right? And so they went to fetch him. And then we find this. They promised him, some, they made some promises to him. They said, listen, if you'll come and help us, we'll promise that you can be the captain. All right? If you'll play for us, you can be the captain. We used to do that when we played ball, by the way. If we wanted the very best player on the team, you know, everybody was out to get them. And so you had to come up with every deal that you'd come up with. Listen, you could be on my kickball team. We'll let you be the, we'll let you be the manager. You could, you could assign everybody the base. You could, you could set the lineup. You can do it all. We'll let you be in charge of our team if you'll just play on our team. That's what they're doing with Jephthah. He is so valiant in, in, uh, in battle that they say, we want you on our team. But here's the funny thing. I love his response to all of this. Um, he says in verse 7 of chapter 11, And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, Did not you hate me and expel me out of my father's house? And why are you coming to me now when you're in distress? He says, you threw me out. But now... You realized how much you need me, and so now you want me to come back. You took the inheritance from me. You told me you wanted nothing to do with me, but now you're in trouble, so you come and get me, and you want me to bail you out. This is exactly what's happening, and they pretty much said, well, yeah, that's what's happening, but we'll let you be captain, all right? We're going to let you be the lead. The armies are going to be all at your disposal. You're going to be the boss. So he called them out on their hypocrisy. Um, but he seems to be a really good guy. He goes ahead and agrees to do this. He says, well, yeah, he says, I'll do this, all right? I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do what you asked me to do. And so this is, I mean, this is incredible. I mean, 
all of us probably can be a little bit this way at times. I mean, I hate to have to eat my words, you know. I hate to have to backtrack and, you know, everybody hates that. But that's where we are here, all right? And uh, we do that with God sometimes. You ever, you ever think about how often we do this with God? You know, God saves us, loves us, cares for us, and then we get caught up in our lives and God's not really important uh, because we've got all these other things going on. I'm raising a family. I've got a job to take care of. I've got responsibilities. And all of a sudden, the things of God just kind of get pushed aside. And then all of a sudden, tragedy hits. What do we do? Fall on our face in prayer. Oh, God, come and help me. God, fix this. God, do this. God, do that. God, God come and heal me. God, you know what? I, I don't mean to be a smart aleck, but I wonder how many of our prayers are never heard just because of our own attitudes. Here's a situation where the people represent that. They say, Jephthah, we really need you. And he agrees to come to their aid. By the way, more often than not, that's what God does. All he wants to do is hear us repent. All he wants to do is, is see something change in our life. And by the way, it's not just a God, you know, I'll do this if you'll do that. It's not that. What God wants to see in our life is, listen, I, I surrender. You know, I give up to you. You need to be the captain of my life. You need to lead and guide me and direct me. And I want to surrender to your will. All right? Um, our time's up, so I'm going to have to come back to the rest of this. But this is a really cool story, and so we'll probably rehash a little bit of that just to make it fresh in your mind uh, next time we come back. But this is a neat story that a lot of people, a lot of people probably never even think to look at, and they don't even know it exists. So we'll come back to it. All right? Any, uh, any questions or any comments? Yeah. Samson? I'm going to say that Samson was probably saved in that last moment of his life, if I had to guess. Um, because he was designated to be what God wanted him to be and do what God wanted him to do, but... It, but in all honesty, we don't see any example of that until this last moment in his life. So my guess would be, and this is a guess on my part, but my guess would be it was in that last moment of his life that he actually surrendered to the will of God, and the faith that he exercised in that last moment was stupendous. All right. That's a good question, though. All right. Anyone else? Okay. Let's go ahead and dismiss. Dear Father, Lord, thank you for the day you've given us this evening. We ask, Lord, that uh, you'll watch over us and keep us safe. Lord, be with our teens this week. I pray, Lord, that you'll just continue to work and move in their hearts and their lives. Lord, I pray that um, they'll come back renewed, come back excited about what you can do. I pray, Lord, that they will uh, realize just how great a God that, just, that they serve. Lord, thank you for the privilege. And I pray, Lord, for each of our children that are next door. I pray for the teachers. Lord God, I pray that you'll um, work in their lives, their hearts, with our buses, all of those that we have the opportunity to reach that may not have ever had an opportunity to see or know Christ otherwise. Lord, thank you for the privilege of being able to reach out to them. We love you, Lord, and what you do. Be with us. Go with us into our homes. Be with our sick. Be with those who are facing um, different things that they're facing. Lord God, I just pray that you'll do something great in Jesus' name. Amen.